It is my great pleasure to extend a warm welcome to you at today's seminar on Free and Open in the Pacific, Implication for South Asia Region. This seminar has been collaboratively organized by the Embassy of Japan in Bangladesh and the Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies. The moderator for today is Major General A.N.M. Muniruzaman, and the CPSC, retired president of BAPSS. To set the stage for our deliberations, we are privileged to be graced with the opening remarks of the Mr. Tatsuya Machida, the Minister and Deputy Chief of the Mission from the Embassy of Japan. We are the honor to have the distinguished Professor Ken Jimbo, Professor of the Keio University and Managing Director of International House of Japan as our distinguished keynote speaker. Engaging in this dialogue, we are honored to have the presence of Dr. Lila Fulyasmin, Professor and Chairperson of Department of International Relations, Dhaka University, and Mr. Shafkat Munu, the Senior Research Fellow at BIPSS, as our esteemed discussant. Without any further ado, I kindly request the moderator to carry on the rest of the session. Thank you. Professor Jimbo Ken, ambassadors, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you. I have the distinct pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to a joint seminar organized by Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies and the Embassy of Japan in Bangladesh. And we are here to talk about an issue of great importance. The very concept of free and open in the Pacific was first coined and given by Prime Minister Abe while speaking to the Indian Parliament in 2007, in which he talked about a new geostrategic construct and a concept that binds our continents and our seas. But more interestingly for me, and maybe for many of you, when he talked about the free and, in the, and independent in the Pacific, he went back to history. And the concept, he said, was first given by none other than the Mughal prince Dara Shekel in the year 1655. In his book, which he called Conference of the Two Seas. So that's why we now today in the FYPC, the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean that are bringing together and is the coupling of the seas, building a new geostrategic construct into a dynamic area for freedom, navigation, and prosperity. The concept of free and open in the Pacific, or FYP, has generated considerable attention in recent years. It is a vision for a rule-based international order that promotes peace, stability, and economic prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. At the very core of FYP, it aims to ensure that nations can navigate the waters of the Indo-Pacific freely and peacefully, adhering to international norms and standards. It is a response to the evolving strategic language characterized by shifting power dynamics in the region and beyond, the current economic interdependence, and great number of non-traditional and traditional security challenges in the region. To talk about this, and much more, we have a distinguished speaker today who we will deliver in detail about the issues, and we have two distinguished discussants who will then comment on the issues. You'll also have ample time at the end to give your comments and ask questions to our esteemed panel. 
So without further ado, we shall now go back and hear the comments from the DCM Japanese Embassy. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. Professor uh, Jim Boken Sensei, uh, Faculty of uh, Policy Management, K University, and Management Director of International House of Japan, uh, Major General NM uh, Munuz Zaman, uh, the President of BIPSS, and uh, Dr. Uh, Laudufa Yasmin Sensei, Professor and Chairperson of Department of International Relations, Dhaka University. Mr. Shahkat Munir, uh, the Senior Research Fellow, BIPSS, Excellencies, Ambassador, Distinguished Guests, Colleagues, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum, Konnichiwa, and Good Afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to say a few words at the outset of today's event and welcome you uh, here at our newly built multi-purpose hall of the Embassy of Japan. Um, I thank, first of all, the BIPSS, uh, led by the Major General M&M Munir Zaman, for kind cooperation with the Embassy of Japan in this regard, and honor to invite Professor Jin Boken to this joint chat seminar. Uh, and have his presentation on free and open in the Pacific, or FYP. As a leading and prominent scholar on international security, as well as Japanese foreign and defense policy, I'm very much looking forward to hearing his view and perspective on FYP. Before the professor elaborates on this subject, let me briefly speak on FIP and Japan's practice in Bangladesh, especially in the field of cooperation for peace and stability. Japan aims to develop a free and open Indo-Pacific region through ensuring a rule-based international order in order to bring stability and prosperity for every country, as well as to secure peace and prosperity in the region. In this regard, as stated in Indo-Pacific Outlook of Bangladesh, which was released in April of this year, and the very eve of Honorable Prime Minister Hashinat's visit to Japan, Bangladesh is a country recognizing the importance of rule-based maritime order and sharing its value with Japan and other like-minded countries. As is clearly illustrated and restressed in the Japan's new plan for FYP announced by our Prime Minister Kishida in last March, Japan has constantly emphasized rule of, uh, uh, rule of law at sea. There, Japan will expand its efforts for ensuring maritime security through defense cooperation, including unit-to-unit -unit exchange, training program, goodwill exercises, and provision of equipment and materials with various countries. Uh, in the context of practical cooperation with Bangladesh, there have been frequent port calls at the Chotgram by vessels of the uh, Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force and the high-level mutual visit of Japan Self-Defense Force and Bangladesh Armed Force in recent years. Furthermore, in April, Japan established a new cooperation framework called Official Security Assistance, or OSA, for the benefit of armed forces and our related organizations for the purpose of deepening security cooperation. And Bangladesh is selected as one of four candidate countries for this new scheme, which shows how much Japan attaches importance to Bangladesh. Also, the negotiations on agreement concerning the transfer of defense equipment and technology is going on. Together with Industrial Value Chain Initiative, we can play a pivotal role in materializing a free and open Indo-Pacific region under the new plan 
of FOIP. And uh, after the, um, the seminar, we expect that there's going to be a plenty of time for networking, as I see that so many are the, the important personalities in this uh, juncture here in this hall. So I expect that you are going to spare a little bit more time to get to know with each other and exchange personally the views with um, uh, Professor Jimbo. Once again, I thank Professor Jimbo to provide a wonderful opportunity for all participants to interact on security issues and to give us insightful academic analysis and FYP vision. Let's enjoy stimulating and illuminating seminar with all participants. Thank you very much. Arigatou gozaimashita. Thank you, Mr. Mashida, for your opening comments. We are about to start the main lecture and the session. As I said in the beginning, the Indo-Pacific region is the vast expanse of ocean that stretches from the eastern coast of Africa to the western coast of Americas. And it has now emerged as the epicenter of the global geopolitics and geoeconomics. South Asia, as a critical region or a sub-region of the world, has several important implications in this geostrategy construct. And they range from political implications to economic implications to security implications social implications, and many more. For example, a free and open Indo-Pacific promotes democratic values, transparency, and the rule of law for all. For the South Asian nation, the concept encourages democratic governance and the respect of human rights. It offers an opportunity for countries in the region to align themselves with democratic principles, principally fostering greater political stability. I'm sure our professor this afternoon will go into detail of this and many more. So let me first introduce our esteemed speaker for this afternoon. Dr. Jimbo Ken is the managing director of the International House of Japan and a professor at Kyo University. He served as special advisor to the Minister of Defense, the Ministry of Defense, and senior advisor at the National Security Secretariat. His main research fields are international security, Japan-US security relations, Japanese foreign and defense policy, multilateral security in the Asia Pacific, and regionalism in East Asia. He has been a policy advisor for various Japanese governments, commissions, and research groups, including the National Security Secretariat, the Minister of Defense, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs. His policy writings have appeared and been published by NBR, the Rand Corporation, Stimson Center, the Pacific Forum CSIS Japan, Japan Times, and many more. The professor has a wide-ranging publications and including many books of international repute. For the sake of time, I'm not going into the details so that you are able to listen to the professor and then subsequently also ask him questions. So with that introduction, Professor, the floor is yours. Well, uh, Major General uh, Mundi Rizaman, um, President of the uh, BPISS, um, thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. And I'd like to begin by uh, thanking BPISS and the Embassy of Japan for hosting this uh, wonderful event. And uh, great to see uh, so many faces uh, gather in this uh, podium and, uh, and all the floor. Uh, very warm welcome uh, to uh, all of you. It is my first visit to Bangladesh in 30 years, actually. Uh, so this is my second time in Dhaka. Um, 
30 years ago, what happened was I was a still college student, but I participated in the research investigation group of the Japanese ODA project, both in Thailand and Bangladesh. And I was uh, very fortunately chosen as a student uh, representative of the groups. So I vaguely remember <laughs> what, what was like in Dhaka 30 uh, years ago, but uh, revisiting here is a, such a pleasure and uh, great to see the developments and uh, great to see uh, find the more developments in the, in the days to come uh, with uh, interaction with all of you. And something that I already found uh, is the great intellectual dynamism uh, that has been happening uh, in this city. So uh, I'll be very much uh, looking forward to uh, having a great uh, interaction uh, with all of you. Um, today, as uh, um, uh, uh, Chair and uh, Minister Machida have kindly um, uh, introduced, we're going to talk about the concept of Indo-Pacific. And this concept, um, as uh, already mentioned by the President, uh, that uh, has been mentioned historically, uh, it has, has a long historical backgrounds. But in the policy-wise, how we can officialize uh, the Indo-Pacific as the major regional platform of the policy, which only has less than 10 years. Uh, in the history. And this is quite a remarkable to see why so many countries have adopted the Indo-Pacific as the, uh, I think, guiding principle of its regional engagement strategy. Not only the countries who are geo uh, geographically located uh, inside Asia and the Indo-Pacific region, but also that extends to the many members of the European states in the EU and Latin America, whenever they talk about how they try to engage in the region, they adopted the concept of Indo-Pacific. So this is the gravity concept, and definitely we really need uh, to investigate uh, what has been the emergence uh, of the dynamics of this concept, what could be the potential uh, opportunities and challenges. So, I prepared um, you know, a couple of slides uh, to explain about my take uh, on this and by looking forward to uh, having an even deeper discussion uh, with uh, discussants. So let me briefly uh, point out uh, the historical sequence of the how there has been a back and forth of the regional concepts in past several decades. And I think uh, you're all aware uh, about the dynamics uh, has already emerged uh, in back in 1970s and 80s with the emergence of the concept of Asia Pacific. And why Asia Pacific? Because there has been the Asia miracle of the dynamic economic growth has been taking place in many of the East Asian countries. And then all the members uh, try to, uh, you know, get involved in those processes uh, that actually led to the emergence of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation or APEC to be ele uh, elevated into the ministerial level of conference and even the summit. The APEC st still exists and this year the United States will be hosting in San Francisco about the summit meeting that will be uh, taking place. The APEC uh, is the uh, quite an open-ended uh, regionalization processes, which is a quite different from what happened in 1950s and 60s. Uh, there are uh, several uh, economic cooperation schemes that you can find in Latin America, uh, also in Caribbean states, uh, and also some in the Middle East. But they were originally formed as a trade input substitution types of the mechanisms. They have to protect the industry. They have to cultivate their own industry by setting up its own tariffs um, and also all the non-tariff measures uh, in order to cultivate uh, their industries. But um, generally speaking, it ended up in failure because they do not really have a cultivation uh, to uh, generate its own kind of competitiveness uh, at home. So right after the oil crisis in 1970s, people felt that, oh, regionalism is over. Uh, they all have to get into the IMF uh, GATT uh, types of the regime to deal uh, with the uh, international standards of the trade and goods uh, flows through those international regimes. But now the apex comes in uh, as a, another 
open-ended scheme because everybody uh, wished to be part of those uh, Asian uh, economic dynamics. But as you know that the APEC has its own <laughs> limits. Why? Because, because of the nature of the open-ended regional uh, structure, it doesn't really have uh, the, uh, I think, at, uh, you know, screening processes of what could be the collective measures to be taken uh, in the multilateral setting. If you become an EU member, you have to go through the lots of screening processes, starting from the standardization and association acts. You have to have a governance standards. You have to have economic fundamentals to be eventually adopted by the all members of the European Council. That's a really rigid process to become the EU member. Uh, this is as if like uh, you become the member of the platinum card of the gold card. But in the Asia Pacific, it is like a student card. Uh, everybody can uh, become the member, but the credit you have will be very much limited. So what happened was that uh, if you become uh, the members who wish to maintain its comfort zone in the collaboration, you always have to adapt yourself into the least collaborative actors uh, in the APEC. So that, what about Bogol declaration? Everybody, you know, pledged that uh, by 2010s that everybody wished to become the free trade area. In 2020, all the emerging me uh, economy members also become the free trade area, but didn't happen. Why? Because that the APEC is such an open-ended uh, regional uh, cooperation. So I think that the you know country like Singapore uh, started to have a more much more. Uh, wise way to deal with a bilateral uh, FTA and everybody starts to follow uh, because they don't want to really avoid the trade diversion effect by one country goes to the free trade area and somebody has to really follow. So these kind of sequence have started as early as 1990s. But in 1990s, another, uh, I think, uh, uh, phenomenal things happened. That was the Asian financial crisis in 1997. And uh, since that, there has been the huge flows of the capitals uh, in, into this uh, market, but uh, fluidity uh, of the domestic financial markets created uh, the, the mismatch uh, of the maturities of the, um, you know, the domestic financial market versus what has been you know, producing uh, through those um, um, uh, investments. And that created the huge depreciation of the local currency starting from the Thailand, but also spread over to Indonesia and also in Korea. But I think that the thing is, who really created the rescue package uh, for the um, uh, Asian financial crisis? They initially tried to ask IMF to deal with it, but IMF still has a, still have a huge neoclassical uh, conditionality standards, and, and that really jeopardized so many, uh, I think, uh, you know, governance uh, issues in Indonesia, Korea, uh, and so on. And then that the Asian country tried to adapt the new scheme of cooperation accidentally through the ASEAN plus three uh, network. ASEAN can 10 countries plus Japan, Korea, uh, and also China. And that was accidental because that uh, 1997 was the 30th anniversary of the launching of the ASEAN, uh, because it was launched in 1967. And then the Prime Minister Hashimoto of Japan proposed that, why don't we celebrate that, uh, you know, 30 years of the Japan-ASEAN diplomatic uh, relationship. The ASEAN response is that, you know, we, uh, uh, we, we like Japan. We, we think that Japan is a friendly, strategic nation. We wish to have a, a good relationship, but we don't want to single out Japan as a nation to celebrate, so why don't we invite Korea and China all together? And that was actually the beginning uh, of the uh, East Asian, uh, sorry, the ASEAN Plus Three uh, Summit. And then the, you know, they have to deal with the Asian financial crisis. So they rapidly adopted to find out that they need to annualize this event. And they need to come up with a scheme how much they can really help uh, to mitigate this situation. And then, very interestingly that they came up with a financial swap mechanism that is called the Chen Mai uh, Initiative uh, in later uh, these years. And they found out that new kind of potential of the regional cooperation, even without the United States and even without the European direct involvement. And that was, I think, created the new confidence, how much they can internally generate such kind of strengths to deal uh, with the problem. And that was the story of 1990s, and, and that was the emergence of the concept of the East Asia through practice, you know, practical uh, approaches to those uh, issues. But story never ended there, 
because uh, there was in 2000, several nations have started to begin to talk about why don't we start to call ourselves East Asia rather than ASEAN plus one, two, three, right? Uh, we call it more squarely about what's been going on in this region. And that, be, that you know, uh, the discussion began to start uh, in, in late 19, 2003 to 2004. Um, and then, then the time that the Malaysian president, um, you know, Mr. Badawi, claimed that uh, Malaysia should be the one to host the first East Asian summit. Why? Because there was a legendary prime minister called um, Mr. Mahathir. Um, he is a still legendary figure in the Malaysian politics. But as early as in mid-1990s, he was the first initiator uh, to talk about the East Asian economic caucus. And that is the economic grouping of East Asian countries without the United States and without other major powers. And during that time, I think he was too early to um, ask for these kind of concepts because the concept was heavily criticized by Washington, D.C., and even by China. So that, uh, you know, Malaysia has, uh, you know, draw back those kind of uh, proposal with a lot of resentment. But after the financial crisis and after 2000, there's a new kind of initiative has been grown, and Malaysia come back and say, we should be the country to host the East Asian Summit in 2005, because uh, Malaysia is a chair country of the ASEAN during that time. Okay, so what happened was that, what, what is the East Asian Summit, by the way? Is that the same meaning of the ASEAN plus three, just to rename the organization? Or are we going to have a two organization in the double truck, uh, ASEAN plus three plus East Asian Summit, or something else? Who should be the member state of the East Asian Summit? Who should lead the processes? Is it only ASEAN, or is it together with unknown ASEAN countries. And there are lots of politics be, you know, begun. And some people say that the, why don't we have ASEAN, non-ASEAN rotational um, uh, chairmanship? And actually, Japanese government was reluctant to accept this uh, concept because if that rotation starts to begin, you know, ASEAN, non-ASEAN, ASEAN, non-ASEAN, and then if that is initial, by the way, proposal was uh, the East Asian Summit should be biannual processes, right? So that if you have a mathematics of the sequence of the events, if Japan was taking the last round of the chairmanship of the non-ASEAN, it may take 10 years before Japan takes the first chair of the East Asian Summit. So this is the, you know, this is a trap. I mean, this is something like uh, quite a, uh, you know, difficult way to create the, mom you know, momentum, the modality of the East Asian Regional Cooperation Scheme. So they have ended up by having the uh, annual processes led only by ASEAN. Okay, so this is a quite a, you know, we call it ASEAN centrality, and you know, we, we can, you can raise where's the ASEAN centrality in this uh, major power dynamics, but. Again, whenever you try to have this kind of institutionalization processes, we have nobody else but ASEAN to take this lead. That was the reality of the 2005. Um, and then, you know, we have also incorporated the new members like uh, Australia, New Zealand, and India to become the foundation member of the East Asian Summit in 2005. And the story never ends there. In 2010, something else has happened. By having the East Asian Summit, there has been the growing awareness that the China has been on the constant growth. China is the elephant in the room for everybody and also for the East Asian Summit. What about, about the collective strength to balance those kind of Chinese influences? Are we enough by having uh, like, uh, you know, 15 nations get together to deal with a China problem and then they began to think that we should add some, something more. And then that was the moment that we, we means that the East Asia Summit have decided to invite the United States and also the Russia. That was a quite, quite a choice at the time to uh, become the member of the East Asian Summit. So ended up with the 18th country, East Asia Summit has become one of the political body to represent the, the regionalism uh, in East Asia. And still, um, Japanese government called this is a premier forum, and this is a very important uh, kind of transaction uh, in the East Asia to deal comprehensively on what has been uh, going on. So in that regard, whenever the President Biden you know, says that he 
uh, decided not to go to East Asian Summit, uh, you know, this, this year, that was very disappointing uh, for uh, many of those participating members. Uh, President Biden uh, mentioned about his disappointment about the President Xi Jinping not going to G20 uh, this year. But I think at the same, uh, I think at the message uh, to be extended to the, to the Washington DC over this issue. Because this is the forum where many of those representation of the emerging power should be raising the voice uh, inside. So I'm going to talk a bit about you know, uh, what, what has been the distribution of the power and how that the emerging power should be represented uh, in the voices of the international community. These are the new kind of elasticity of those kind of regional grouping to reflect the reality of the redistribution of power uh, in this part of the world. So this is a story up until 2000, and then we are now looking into the new concept called the Indo-Pacific. As uh, many have already pointed out that, uh, you know, you can, you can trace back the origins a uh, long time ago, and uh, also you can name uh, the prime, former Prime Minister Abe's um, the speech in the Indian Parliament uh, mentioning about the confluence of the two seas as a symbolical kind of dynamics uh, to move these um, uh, things forward. And I think that the first officialized uh, version of the Indo-Pacific policy can be traced back to former Prime Minister Abe's speech back in 2016 when he visited Kenya in the occasion of having a TCAT meeting. TCAT is a Japan-Africa cooperation scheme. Then uh, Prime Minister have made an official speech that the Japan declare that uh, we are going to promote the regional policy called the Indo-Pacific. And this has been the origin of the process of uh, you know, uh, this concept. And then there he also mentioned about the confluence of the two seas, and that is the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and also the two continents. Uh, that's the U.S. continents in Eastern Africa. That's a massively, you know, vast coverage of the geographical concept under this scheme. By the way, that I think the Japanese government uh, is not claiming the copyright of this concept. <laughs> and I think that the Prime Minister Kishida has uh, repeatedly say, saying that this is our concept uh, of the FOIP. And, and this has a, quite a strategic meaning. Whenever you have a fingerprint about that this is a US version or this is Japanese version, this really uh, pressures uh, the regional players uh, which, which, what, part, what kind of VoIP or what kind of Indo-Pacific you're going to uh, you know, take. This is not, I, I think, uh, what I think Japanese government tried to mention. VoIP should be for everybody. And I think a VoIP can be only successful if everybody's in the town can claim its own copyright. Because if you, you're looking at the very different Indo-Pacific as a priority, as a geographical coverage, and food to collaborate with. And I think those are the things to be uh, you know, embraced inside the whole concept of the COIP. And that is, I think, at the essential uh, condition for the success of this concept. And I'll come back to this issue later. Um, by the way, why do we have to think, care about uh, you know, FOIP? And I, I, I do personally think that the FOIP is a very important uh, concept. And I think that uh, uh, because there has been the geopolitical and geoeconomic gravity associated with uh, this concept. And obviously, there, uh, you, can, you can name a few about uh, there has been a huge opportunity regarding uh, the concept of uh, the Indo-Pacific. You can find the economic growth of South Asia, including Bangladesh, of course, Southeast Asia, Middle East, and North and East Africa. Um, I think you are paying attention to the IMF uh, periodical World Economic Outlook um, and uh, carefully watching what would be the post-COVID uh, economic uh, growth prospect for the world. And you can find that uh, Europe, North America, Japan, Korea, uh, Australia has been slow in recovering uh, processes. And you have China still maintains the high economic growth, but the recently uh, there's lots of news that there has been the volatility uh, of the real estates, financial sectors, and many of those uh, central uh, local uh, financial standards. Uh, and then that really gives us uh, uh, very uncertain prospects of the Chinese growth uh, for the future. 
But you look at India, but you look at the South Asia uh, and the Middle East and North Africa, they're promising, I mean, standards of the continued sustainable economic growth uh, for the future that definitely creates the new distribution of the economic power in the world markets and the world economy. And that is a huge, I think, opportunity that the growing voices of the emerging powers uh, should be represented in the international political scene because of these, uh, you know, distribution of power uh, dynamically changing. That's, that's the first opportunity of Indo-Pacific that I like to highlight. But at the second, Indo-Pacific also contains the huge sets of the challenges, which everybody cannot really ignore. That is the return of geopolitics, geopolitical recession, and expanding geoeconomics. And, and th those are very, I mean, uh, you know, the huge concept to uh, uh, deal with. But name a few that since 2010s, many of the premises that we used to um, you know, have uh, on the globalization by, look, you know, by reading, everybody reads that uh, Thomas Friedland's word is flat. And I was amazed at, uh, you know, what he says about, uh, you know, um, whenever you are, um, uh, you know, where, where you, whenever you live, well, wherever you live, if you can plug and play into the globalization dynamics, you will get the opportunity of economic competitiveness. So that the economic competitive playing ground uh, for the world market has become levelized. And, and that is the you know, essential component of the globalization, according to uh, his book. And I was so much uh, impressed by uh, this issue. And then I was uh, you know, security geopolitics specialist, but uh, my job will be declined because of, because of the globalization. And you don't have to think about the great power competitions, uh, national sovereignties, and national security, those are the issue of the past. And then that, uh, you know, those economic gravity of um, globalization, how much you can really take the opportunity. If you become the business leaders, you really have to get the optimum, you know, investment strategy, business strategy to really capitalize this globalization efforts. And that's a criteria of the good, you know, manager. Uh, in the you know multi-sectoral uh, you know companies uh, in the world, but it is no longer there since 2010s, and I think that the globalization has its own limits, and we were um, unfortunately heavily uh, I think uh, constrained by the re-emergence of the geopolitics, um, Russian invasion of the Georgia 2008, annexation of Crimea, uh, bombing of Syria and then, uh, you know, invasion of the Ukraine, and that those series of uh, the, the re-emergence of the Russia as a threat in Europe has changed the perception of the European defense and security fundamentally. And this is, I think, a huge issue of the return of geopolitics in the transatlantic domain. But also you can find a lot of uh, great power rival lead in the, in, the, in the Middle East and Arab worlds between the Saudi and the Iran. And also you can find similar types of the re you know, emergence of the India in the South Asia that cre also creates the huge balance of power uh, opportunities and concerns in South Asia. And if you look at uh, Southeast Asia and East Asia, there is a rise of China uh, everywhere. North Korea fully determined to become a nuclear power. And then you also have to deal with the Far East and Russia, especially after the, the invasion of Ukraine as well. So th these are the reality that we are facing uh, every day. And every business person, a government official, have to deal with a geopolitical question much frequently than what we had 20 years ago. And this is the, I think, at, uh, uh, the day-to-day the -day, uh, reality that we are facing uh, right now. And then that, uh, you know, what, what happened in the Europe and, and also for the Japan and Korea's perspective, that 20 years ago, we were very much global. We sent so many PKOs and uh, you know, uh, so many international engagement in the world. And from European perspective, they should become the, you know, the, the, the country who should, should have a global engagement rather than dealing with uh, internal issues. And that was the situation in 20 years ago. But look at it. Now Japan sends no PKOs. We only send the liaisons, and I think uh, very, I think, uh, you know, impressed by the Bangladesh forces has been a major contributor to the uh, peacekeeping mission all over the world. But unfortunately, 
uh, from Japanese perspective that uh, it's good that we, we uh, offer like a capacity building efforts through the Bianchan visions and the, uh, you know, uh, the, as uh, Minister Machida mentioned about the newly scheme as the official uh, security assistance, those kind of functional cooperation has been robustly uh, going, going for sure. But in, in terms of the Japanese engagement in the global affairs, it has been declined. So, you know, some, some Japanese says that uh, we are, you know, the nation with a peaceful constitution starting from the territorial defense, very limited, confine ourselves in the territorial defense, and then go to the region, and then go to the globe, and this is the normalization of the Japan as a nation. Many people have th thought about it 20 years ago, but in my perception, we are you turning back to the region and back to the territorial defense. Why? Because we are so busy with the, you, you know, um, the geopolitical situation surrounding Japan, starting from China, but also with North Korea, and also with Russia. And it doesn't mean that the, we are confined ourselves only with the territorial defense, because I will, I'm going to mention uh, you know, uh, in a few moments that uh, the, the distribution of power in Northeast Asia is so dynamic which requires Japan and also the United States to ally more with uh, emerging powers in the Indo-Pacific. So that, you know, we are so busy with uh, our own problems, but that requires the wider security cooperation uh, in this region. This is the dynamics that we are dealing with. Um, the central question remains to be how to deal with China. Uh, also that that is slightly now shifting towards China is not only rising power, but also that the many others are also rising. So how to configure those new dynamics is the essential question, but we also have to start the question of the rising uh, of China. But I think it has a two major track of the strategy, how to deal with China. Definitely that requires how to craft a competitive strategy in dealing with China, starting from how to create the new balance of power, uh, because 20 years ago and today is a very different when you look at Korean Peninsula, when you look at Taiwan, East China Sea, South China Sea, I think the composition of the creating of the deterrent structure is very different. And we, we definitely need to have a more investment, we definitely need to have a more different types of the strategic concept to be uh, aligned, which I, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be happy to elaborate during the Q&A. Uh, session and this is a you know security domain of the competitive strategy and then you are now experiencing the economic domain of the competitive strategy look at 2018 you know Trump administration strategy to adopt the export control import um, um, you know criteria of the screening processes um, and also uh, you know very tight uh, kind of regulations uh, over the, uh, you know, the, the, all the, uh, the government procurements uh, uh, processes um, and, and so on. And that really creates uh, that uh, economic domain is also very much constrained by the geopolitics, especially in the emerging technology fields, symbolically uh, by the semiconductors, but also that extends to the batteries, um, also rare earth minerals, um, you know, also the medical goods and, and, and all else. So once that the United States creates such kind of regulations and the name some of the Jap Chinese company as an entity list or the civil military fusion types of the entities, it is very hard to continue the normal business uh, with them, not from the U.S. company's perspective, but also the third parties. Uh, perspective as well. So from the Japanese uh, business uh, you know, point of view that we are always watching what's going to happen next from the Washington DC over the regulating uh, the transaction with the Chinese uh, companies. The, uh, make no mistake that the, you know, the trade with China is booming. You know, the, I think in 2002 statistics, Japan-China trade marked the historically high on the volumes of the trade, but that is on the commodity side. And I think that there is a kind of selective kind of decoupling processes is certainly going on. We are carefully adopting the export control policy of the high tech transfer. We have adopted the new national security promotion law in order to identify what will be the strategic goods needs to be secure and preserved inside uh, in our national uh, you know, you know, national uh, screening processes, and then not to let the free flow of technologies to be 
um, you know, uh, obtained by the China uh, that might speed up the process of, of the technological revolutions that will be equipped to the Chinese next generation military technologies uh, as well. So certainly these kind of competition has been going on in the economic domain uh, as well. But it's not only about the competition. We are also seeking how to collaborate, how to inclusively cooperate uh, that, 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 that involves China uh, as well. And that, uh, this is very hard to kind of strategize, but because who is leading this strategy? It is not only the government, but that is the private sector who is doing the business with China, who is investing in China, creating the standards of the economic interdependence uh, with China. So interdependence is a good thing because according to the international trade theory, you really have to trade. I mean, you really have to allow those high productivity sectors to, you know, to promote the productions and then to import. And then you do your own kind of uh, sectors to export it. And those create the world economy more vibrant. But something that is happening now is, I think many of you are aware that the weaponization of the interdependence is currently going on. Now that China is very furious about our, you know, exposure of the, um, the, 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 they call it contaminated water from the, uh, the, the, the Fukushima uh, nuclear plant, but, but this is the kind of uh, settled, uh, you know, the waters uh, to be uh, exposed into the sea. But as a countermeasure that the China uh, decided to uh, ban the imports of the old uh, Japanese fishery, uh, products uh, to the Chinese uh, market. And this really damaged the Chinese, uh, you know, uh, the Japanese exporters of, in these sectors because they are the major customers. And similar type of thing happened in the rare earth materials in 2010s um, for the Australia wines and coals, Philippines bananas, and many else, and the Chinese, uh, you know, Taiwan pineapples. And, and with they are effective because that those kind of exporters rely on the Chinese ex, uh, market so much. So I think that in, in that context, we have to think about to what extent that the, you can really have an optimum interdependent relationship with the countries which creates the opportunity but also creates the huge concerns. So this creates a very difficult uh, way to deal uh, with the uh, how we can really combine the competitive strategy and cooperation strategy uh, moving forward. So these are conceptual part of it. So I will uh, speed up my uh, you know, lecture to finish by showing some of those uh, you know, details of what's been uh, going on in this region. On the security and defense, uh, there has been uh, the active engagement has been taking place uh, through the maintaining of the U.S. presence in the Indo-Pacific uh, regions. Everybody's hidden agenda remains to be to keep United States in to these processes. Uh, I mean, United States is no longer the sole superpower to, you know, uh, and come and help all, all the issues. They are much more contested in a way to how to deal uh, with the issues, and they require more collaboration with uh, friends and allies uh, in this region. But I think from our perspective, as a major ally in East Asia, I think the United States remains to be the cornerstone to provide the status quo management uh, in this region, and that is also true for Korea, that is also true for Australia, or even country like uh, Singapore, which has no formal uh, treaty relation with the United States, but regard the United States as a very important strategic uh, collaborator. And that, that is also, with uh, lots of gradation involved, but there's also the, uh, some, some kind of truce in the South, Asia, uh, South Asian countries that the United States' sound involvement in the Indian Ocean may provide the very important, I think, stability effect uh, in this region. And the United States tried to, I think, uh, structurize these uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, collaboration through so-called the trilateral or the mini-lateral processes by um, emphasizing the importance of the U.S., Japan, Australia, U.S., Japan, Korea, uh, U.S., U.K., Australia, so-called the AUKUS uh, relationship, and that has been also being uh, uh, new dynamics that has been playing out uh, in this field. And as uh, uh, Minister Machida also mentioned about the OSA, and then I think uh, in advance of that, there has been uh, lots of practical cooperation going on between the Japanese Self-Defense Force and the, those kind of counterparts in the region through the mill-to-mill -mill relationship and, through, and also through the multilateral practices and exercises. And the Japan also be 
the humble player uh, in this field uh, as well. Maritime capacity building is also very important uh, in this field. That is also outlined in the new plan of the uh, Indo-Pacific because something that we definitely need to have a sophisticated type of the escalation management uh, in the maritime uh, security. So we don't want uh, the coastal states in the Indo-Pacific to just to give up on the Chinese coercive uh, pressure on their maritime claim in the uh, exclusive economic zone, all the, you know, the maritime territories or, or so. But we also don't want the coastal states to overreact by sending the military vessels to deal with uh, gray zone uh, challenges. Definitely what we need is the coastal patrol policing law enforcement mechanism. And there we have to cultivate more onto the coast guards and also the maritime policing and also the legal measures to be adopted uh, because we do have an UNCLOS and those kind of law of the sea should be the, uh, the guiding principles to move uh, these uh, maritime standards to be uh, adopted by the regional states. In that states, we definitely need the capacity uh, building of the law enforcement, especially in the low and medium end of the conflict escalation ladder. And those are, I think, at the security and defense. And I won't uh, go into the details of the economic outreaches. And there has been a lots of, uh, I think, um, uh, project on the project financing uh, that has been uh, taking place. And something that is, uh, you know, uh, need to encompass is that Japan uh, wished to be the dominant player once again in this uh, project finance field. Japanese ODA has been, uh, I mean, declined into the half of the scale uh, compared to the 1997. I was a committee member uh, of, the, of the Japanese government to review the process of the official development assistance. And as you know that the Japan has decided to double the size of the defense budget in uh, last uh, strategy we adopted in December, our committee also recommended the government we should double the size of the ODA and as well. And the Ministry of Finance was very angry. We don't have money to spend us, <laughs> such kind of thing. But, but I, I think this uh, is also be the case because um, if you don't really have an alternative project financing project, somebody else will dominate. And I think that uh, something that is happening is that, that there are newly incoming donor who is not constrained by so-called the OECD's development assistance committee standards. Uh, that involves the you know, sound basis of the governance, susta sustainable development, and also that, uh, you know, those kind of uh, screening processes for the finance to be involved. And that is slow, that is, uh, you know, um, uh, I think it takes the time. The scale is become, becoming uh, much smaller. And those new dominant player uh, comes in, they are very quick, easy money, and then disperse to uh, everybody. But it creates a lots of, I think, after effects. And I think that those kind of alternatives uh, are very important for the regional play because it's a heavy demand for the infrastructure in coming decades, and those have to be financed by the sound basis of the selection processes in order for those recipients to maintain the strategic autonomy. This is very important. Autonomy is not only generated through by yourself, but it is the kind of the capacity to select what it has been offered. And those kind of creates the bargaining power for the recipients. And I think that Japan should be the one to offer such kind of alternatives to many of these Indo-Pacific states. So there is a no choice but to become the robust player uh, in this region. So uh, let me uh, conclude by saying a couple of uh, new developments uh, in, in these fields. Um, something that you may be fascinated uh, is the, that the growing attention has been paid on the concept of the Indo-Pacific, not only uh, by the like uh, major powers, but also uh, by the like uh, you know Australia, Korea, ASEAN, uh, even EU have uh, outlined their own Indo-Pacific strategy to plug and play into this concept. And I was very glad to find out uh, that the government of the Bangladesh also adopted the Indo-Pacific outlook of uh, Bangladesh in April 2000. Uh, 23, and this is also a very thought out, uh, you know, uh, concept, uh, insightful concept. How the Bangladesh try to see its regional engagement policy to, uh, I think, embrace the regional dynamics. Um, also, that what, what is what you can find from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, website 
is that uh, it, this is very hard to look at it, but uh, uh, this is the reality of the, how the Indo-Pacific has spread, spread out in the, each of the government's uh, official policies. There you can find not only among those uh, you know, regional members, but also Europe, Latin America all come into play to deal with the uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. But uh, you can ask why do, do, do those need, country needs a strategy for Indo-Pacific? In my own understanding, because that the strategy needs to coordinate the cross-sector interests in Indo-Pacific. If you only let the private sectors to deal with Indo-Pacific, and, and that is about the businesses, that is about the making profits. But if you all let the military to deal with the Indo-Pacific, that is all, all about the deterrence and uh, you know, how we can really make a coalitions, but you all need to coordinate those some seemingly contrasted interests to be coordinated to deal with the uh, Indo-Pacific. There you need to have uh, the strategy to deal with it. Um, and this is the kind of uh, outlook of uh, what's been going on in this region. Uh, and uh, you know, the China is on the rise, the United States will be uh, taken over by China as a sheer size of the GDP, probably around 2030s. But at the same time, something uh, you can highlight is the emerging of the emerging states. Uh, used to be that Japan was the dominant player, uh, but uh, in 2020s, uh, I think that the mini country has become the liberalized player in this field. And that really creates the level ground of the cooperation among the regional members. And that is also true for the defense. And this is a striking figure because that uh, back in 2005, Japanese and uh, Chinese defense budget was almost equalized, but now China spends uh, six times more than the Japanese defense budget and 10 times uh, bigger than you know, uh, Japanese defense budget in 2010s, uh, 2030s, if we constrain ourselves in the 1% of the GDP expenditure. So we, we have double the size, uh, in the size of the defense budget. That might slightly change this uh, figure, but not structurally change uh, what has been going on. But I think that the more opportunity that you can have uh, is a growing influence of the regional players, starting from India, but also ASEAN, South Korea, they are all the you know, important players uh, in this field. So that creates the practical cooperation uh, among us, uh, well, you know, beyond the symbolism, and we also have to generate the intra-cooperation uh, schemes among the regional members. And let me conclude by um, sharing some of the slides. By the way, many of you are uh, taking the photos, but I, I, I'll be happy to share uh, my slides, and you can ask the embassy staffs, and the, my, my uh, slides can be uh, downloaded uh, from there. That, great. So. Um, let me conclude by uh, just showing the, the final slides. Uh, this is the Japan's new plan for free and open uh, Indo-Pacific. And I believe that some, uh, I think, a discussions uh, will follow up uh, this uh, you know, concept uh, as well. In March this year, uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, visited India to offer his uh, policy speech on Indo-Pacific. And there are his in basic intentions to renew Japanese uh, commitments on the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. And I think I'm still contemplating what does it really mean uh, for Japan and also for the region. Japan is the country who, you know, who tried to align with the United States and G7 over the many of the strategic issues we face, especially after the you know, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that was the part that Japan made a uh, you know, fundamental choice that we really need to make President Putin, Russian government decision to invade Ukraine as a historical mistake. There, we have to have a tight economic sanction against them to create, uh, you know, international alignments uh, to counter uh, the Russian aggression uh, towards Ukraine. And I, I think this is the, the, the great kind of decision that the Japanese government has made. But in the reality, who joined the economic sanction uh, towards Russia? That's only 38 countries, so as, uh, as of today, uh, towards, towards Russia. And uh, w where is another remaining 130 countries? And I think they do have um, their own kind of practical, pragmatic choices that has been making. Priorities are there on the economic security, energy security, and food security, development needs, and then some of those connotation about uh, criticism of the double standards by the Western uh, thinking and those anti, 
you know, colonialism uh, kind, kind of uh, ideology also creates the kind of the huge debates over what uh, is the status of the world uh, you know, collaboration scheme over uh, these issues. And Japan is uh, very conscious about the so-called Global South uh, types of the notion that we have. I don't know how many of you likes the concept of the Global South, but uh, again, uh, this is the useful terminology to identify what the problem is. Because you do not, you cannot really have a mere extension of the G7 types of the engagement towards the world. You really have to have an alternative path to engage. In my understanding, the new plan is try to address this very important, uh, I think, a divides, uh, you know, divide recognitions uh, of the world. And then this is the reason why that the Japanese government reiterated the concept of the inclusiveness rather than the competitiveness in the Indo-Pacific region. Again, that uh, you know, Indo-Pacific is large, and everybody have a very different, diverse uh, interest. And then everybody has to have its own way of engaging Indo-Pacific. Japan does not have an Indo-Pacific strategy. It may have one in the coming future, but uh, I do not think that the Japanese Foreign Ministry is eager to create the strategy. Why? Because Indo-Pacific is so diverse, you cannot really have a one-fits-all type of the strategy. Alternatively, Japan has come up with uh, four pillars, 51 items of cooperation, and I academically try to analyze it and, and call this is a bizarre diplomacy, <laughs> right? We have a 51 items, and you can just pick and choose uh, whatever you want. And uh, you know, uh, depending upon who you are, where you are, and the, what kind of strategy you have, you can pick and choose the Japanese uh, kind of bazaar. And, and this could be, the, I think, at the very strat, you know, unstrategic but the important approach to mitigate the growing divide that we are experiencing in the world. So I'll stop here and look forward to the further discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Professor, for your very wonderful and detailed presentation. As we heard from the presentation that Indo-Pacific strategy is a comprehensive strategy. It covers a lot of aspects of geostrategy and geoeconomics. And in, er in an era where the geostrategic and geoeconomic landscape is fast changing, the Indo-Pacific strategy offers an adaptive strategy to adapt to much of the changes that are taking place, especially in a period of post-Ukraine, post-COVID, many nations have their own challenges and, and their own priorities. So when we studied and scanned about 13 different Indo-Pacific strategies that have been given out by 13 plus nations, we see that each of the strategies have kept the core intact, but they have adapted to their own scenarios, their own situations, and their own needs. It is a dynamic strategy that adapts to the situation and time. There is a great need for infrastructure development in the region, as the professor mentioned, and that is something most of the countries in the region is perhaps looking at. We are faced with grave NTS or non-traditional security challenges like climate change, like weather changes, and those are issues that have to be brought in so that Indo-Pacific strategy becomes relevant to everybody. We are also looking at new threats on emerging threats like gray zone operations that need to be addressed. We are looking at cyber threat and cyber security that needs to be addressed in the security concept of Indo-Pacific strategy. We are also looking at several sub-concepts of Indo-Pacific strategy like Prime Minister Abe's concept of Big B, for example, and they have to be addressed as well. So, as I said, it is a dynamic process. It is a process that is evolving, and it is a process that is addressing the emerging challenges that come to the region and beyond. We shall be talking much more of this. I shall now turn to our discussants for their comments, and the first discussant to give her comments is Professor Lailu for Yasmin, Professor and Chairperson of Department of International Relations 
at the University of Dhaka. I look forward you have the floor for the next five to six minutes. I'll pass on the microphone to you. Okay, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me as uh, the discussant here, as one of the uh, two discussants here. And uh, thank you also for giving me only five to six minutes. Uh, or else I'll start taking a class again. <laughs> and we, these days, we are talking about Indo-Pacific in so many occasions and in, in so many, uh, using so many perspectives that are almost all, all the time it may sound like a cliche and it may have uh, heard me saying the uh, same kind of things, so, but uh, bear with me, please, in this particular context. Um, I'd like to sort of uh, reflect on what uh, Professor uh, Zimbo has talked about. First of all, sir, kudos for clarifying one uh, understanding and mistake, a common mistake that we have, that Japan does not have an Indo-Pacific strategy. This is something we have been, a few of us have been pointing out, and um, over and over again in different conferences, we, are, we have been called being wrong that Japan has an Indo-Pacific strategy. There's a difference between having an Indo-Pacific strategy and Indo-Pacific uh, overall understanding of the region, as Professor very nicely pointed out, a bazaar diplomacy. This is a policy uh, for all the countries of the world, whoever you can come and choose and pick and apply uh, in specific context. So why Indo-Pacific? Initially, we've heard Professor Manu Zaman pointing out the origin of the, of the term, and then uh, Professor Zimbo pointed out um, that uh, no one, no particular country can actually uh, command a kind of copyright over the concept, obviously. Um, and we know in the early 20th century is uh, with the birth of the concept of geopolitics itself as an academic area of study. Um, Carl, it was the immense contribution of uh, Carl Hauschofer to, um, you know, uh, bring the concept of Indo-Pacific in the Western, uh, from the Western perspective. So why Indo-Pacific is important now? It is not only because of the confluence of the two seas, but also uh, the recognition that uh, uh, the rising geostrategic significance of the countries nowadays depend more on securing the sea lanes of communications, the SLOCs. From that perspective, we can see a turn from Asia-Pacific to the Indo-Pacific. One had a land-based perspective, and the other one recognizes for these countries to develop, we need to secure maritime uh, lanes. So uh, there is a, uh, uh, you know, um, as per, um, uh, Prime Minister Kishida pointed out in his speech in India, that it is a maritime century, and this is it is something that we need to recognize uh, over and over again. So there are four new pillars uh, in the in the last uh, sort of statement in India uh, by uh, Prime Minister Kishida: principles for peace and rules of, for prosperity, addressing challenges in the Indo-Pacific in the Pacific way, uh, multi-layered multi connectivity, extending efforts for security, and safe use of the sea to the air. So there are very important areas that are pointed out in this new outlook about free and open in the Pacific, it is not only talking about us. Uh, free, secure, peaceful, inclusive, and open, but it is also extending the area of operation from the sea to the air, meaning it is looking at a comprehensive security outlook. Now, when it is talking about a comprehensive security outlook, we need to point out, or we need to pay attention to the word security. We often use the word security in so many different contexts, but here, if you look at the three and the, and the, and the four uh, um, sort of pillars, new four pillars, which often has been argued that uh, they kind of overlap with the previous three or pillars of FYP. So here, Japan is paying attention to the global commons. Japan is paying attention to the, uh, uh, to the lack in common understanding and indifference to the fundamental norms of today's very fractured world. So what, what are the global commons? The global commons are climate change, global health infrastructure, uh, the environment, cyberspace, to name a few. So how can different countries can actually work together, they can build resilience, as well as it emphasizes on the sustainability of each of the countries. We all have our comparative advantage, we all have our weak points and strong points. How can we play to our um, you know, particular strength and how can we project it to the rest of the world. So Japan is talking about with this new understanding of FOIP is rule making through dialogue. It is not something that you can impose upon countries, but rather you need to look at what are the ways one country can contribute to the 
society of, of states in the, uh, in the world. It also looks at respecting to the historical and cultural diversity of each of the countries. Uh, no one is perfect and no one can offer solution to the global problem alone. We need to work together, interdependence, something that is being weaponized in today's world. How can we recognize interdependence and how can we recognize that we, we cannot live like islands? Even islands are connected with savers with each other. Therefore, we need to understand these strengths and weakness and work on that. Japan is also pointing out equal partnership among nations, that one country may be small, one country may be big, bigger in size, but here, we need to look into what are the particular uh, issues or what are the particular contributions they can bring to the table. So it is not only talking about the fence sitters, as pointed out uh, by Professor Kishida and also, a, uh, sorry, <laughs> Prime Minister Kishida and here Professor Zimbo, that, you know, uh, we need to look at the Global South. The concept of Global South, one may argue that it is a Cold War product. Um, it, it is because of, you know, uh, North-South divide. But here, Global South is not merely from a political perspective, but, but to show a group of countries who can actually come, to, who can actually uh, uh, sort of bring table to some other areas of discussions. Not only that, that they have a unique point of view. They can work on, you know, active neutrality, or they can talk about passive neutrality. They understand the need for talking, having a talk with Japan. They understand the need for building their own resilience. They can identify which are the areas that Japan can talk, uh, Japan can help them out. So here we are talking about Japan's FIP being not exclusionary, but inclusive approach to look at world peace and to look at collective interest of the world. Because COVID, if one thing it has taught us that, you know, just closing down your borders is not the solution. You have to work together and have to have some kind of, you know, coordination. Because today I'm closing border, tomorrow you are closing border. The, the third day, another country closing border. And then it is uh, sort, of an, uh, sort of this non-coordination can bring about a disaster to inter international uh, trade, international global supply chain, and in so many other areas. So we are talking about being inclusive, talking of collaborative, taking collaborative approach. Last but not the least, I would like to point out that uh, we might not, many of us might not have noticed, but there is a meta -nar narrative of normativity in, in Japan's FYP. What is normativity? It is talking about the way the world should be. It, we know how it is it already is, it is quite fractured. But we need to look into and we need to work on making the way the world should be and the way the world should be constructed not only for us but also for our future generation. Uh, so it is talking about that we, we need to um, look at, uh, we need to fight against revisionism. Instead, we need to look into opportunity uh, uh, that other countries can have. So in this way, when it talks about FIP from, a, um, uh, from, uh, from the meta-narrative of normativity, it talks about that how can middle powers be a part of it. So this is the place where middle, emerging middle powers or middle powers can uh, chime in, can actually be a part of uh, uh, talking about a sort of uh, uh, talking about and um, uh, st creating strength for you know global policy making level. Uh, yes, the world is still uh, quite an unjust place because P5 members uh, unfortunately is at the helm of decision making, but we can see that how even GA can play a role, how these middle powers can play a role, and this is why we can uh, go back a little bit in time that in 2005-2006 when Japanese Foreign Minister Taro Aso first pointed out freedom and pros prosperity. So remember 2005-06, this was right at the beginning of this century. So during from that time, it moved towards the rule-based maritime order. And I'll just point out that Bangladesh's in the Pacific outlook from this perspective not only talks about a rules-based international order, but uh, in a, just a few days back, it was also clarified that we are also talking about a rights-based international order. So altogether, FOIP provides us that forum where we can also talk about rights, we can also talk about justice, we can also talk about how middle powers can actually be agenda setters. They're not only fence sitters. Let me point out, uh, point this out once again. And therefore, there is a, a sort of area where uh, countries
countries, uh, quote unquote, smaller uh, in terms of size, but comes with, uh, you know, 170 million population, they have a right to, you know, present their perspective internationally. And if we, even if we look at the, you know, some of the statistics by 2050, um, the re, uh, some of the recent reports highlight that by 2050, Bangladesh would be supplying fourth largest workforce in the world. We know in Japan, at yesterday's Guardian uh, published a very interesting article about uh, uh, about uh, uh, sort of contention taking place in Japan about outside people. So all together, we are seeing a graying of the great powers. And here comes the idea of inclusivity, where we need to look into uh, countries like Bangladesh, countries like you know other countries who can actually contribute something positively in the in the new world order, in the in the way the world is sort of. Uh, experiencing a change. Uh, thank you. Very inspiring. Ladifor, thank you for your comments. And as you do point out that the Global South needs pathways of inclusivity, because the Global South has multiple needs in various areas, and we must explore the possibilities of the connectivity, of the cooperation, of the exchanges that we can have with other members of the Indo-Pacific. A landmark shift, as you saw from the professor's slide, will take place in 2028, when the Chinese economy overtakes the US economy and becomes the number one economy in the world. So that will be a tectonic shift in the global landscape of economies. And for that, every nation must prepare. We are also in a period when we must with the challenges of emerging technologies. Technologies that have been unknown to us can bring potential for change, can also have destructive consequences. So those are the new areas and avenues that in the Pacific might accept and challenge in the future. We are looking at new landscape of geoeconomics and certainly new landscape of geoenergy. So discuss some of these issues Again, I go back to our next discussion. Shavkat Puni from BIPS, and Shavkat, you have the floor for the next six minutes. Thank you. I think, uh, first of all, let me congratulate Professor Jimbo for an excellent presentation. I mean, not only you gave us a tour de horizon about how the concept came about, but you also talked about how it's sort of re-emerging and refashioning itself. The biggest takeaway from your presentation for me was that the Indo-Pacific is now the center of gravity. And I think that is, uh, as a country uh, which belongs to the Indo-Pacific community, this is definitely something we need to keep in mind. I would again go back to, as uh, Professor Lailofer has also addressed some of the pillars and some of the characteristics of Prime Minister Kishida's re-articulation of the FOIP in March 2023. But I would like to also highlight some of the other aspects that are there in the pillars. For example, the re-emphasizing of the concept of sovereignty, accountable governance, and the rules-based international order. And also how Prime Minister Kishida has talked about inclusivity, diversity, resilience, and openness. And how uh, important it is given some of the changed realities the world is facing today. And in the first pillar, there is a very clear articulation of the principles of for peace and rules for prosperity. And I was also quite struck by this formulation that addressing challenges in an Indo-Pacific way and the proposal of a new focus of cooperation that features the global commons. And Japan will address the challenges, I quote, by enhancing the resilience and sustainability of each society. As a major and a long-term development and a strategic partner of Japan, this is something we in Bangladesh certainly welcome. I'm really heartened, uh, Professor Jimbo, that you have mentioned about the need for enhanced connectivity and the need for countries to have a choice, a menu of choices that they can choose from when, about who they want to partner with. Therefore, IP's strength and value in bettering Indo-Pacific residents' lives will definitely hinge on its ability to meet the regional de infrastructure demand of over one trillion USD per year. And therefore, it's very much welcome that Tokyo has planned, pledged an impressive $75 billion in public and private funds for infrastructure assistance and investment in the Indo-Pacific by 2030. 
I was also quite struck by your uh, remark that you have, uh, you have the group that you are part of has recommended increasing the ODA. I'm sure for Bangladesh it's a very welcome news. I hope it happens. But at the same time, as we rediscover or discovered that the world is not so flat, and with the re-entry of geopolitics, I think Japan's insistence on furthering the rules-based international order is something that I would like to particularly highlight. And I also want to highlight that the preservation and protection of the rules-based international order is neither a preserve of one country or a group of countries, it's a preserve of all countries. And uh, countries like Bangladesh benefit when the rules-based international order is strengthened. Coupled with uh, Prime Minister Kishida's uh, articulation of the FOIP, uh, it is also important to mention that Bangladesh and Japan are entering a new era of cooperation, particularly the area of strategy and security. Uh, the minister has earlier mentioned about the Official Security Assistance, or OSA, and we will also see greater cooperation, uh, greater exchanges between the JSDF and the Bangladesh Armed Forces, so uh, we certainly welcome that, and I think the both countries will immensely benefit from that. We are also very closely observing the outreach that you are doing in northeast of India, especially the development assistance, the infrastructural development that is happening, because that also has major implications for Bangladesh, because we have share a border with three northeast Indian states. So I think uh, those are some of the key highlights, but I was also quite struck that uh, you mentioned about uh, how uh, the Various alliance systems are also refashioning itself. You talked about the evolution of the East Asia Summit. As we speak, the East Asia Summit is meeting in Jakarta. So it would be interesting to see how the global alliance structures, the multilateral structures also re-evolve re in the coming days. But overall, thank you again for your presentation and thank you for articulating to us what Japan's FOIP means. And I think, again, as Professor Lailofer has also mentioned, a key takeaway for us is Japan does not have an Indo-Pacific strategy. We, many of us thought FOIP is Japan's Indo-Pacific strategy, but it's not. But it's a concept which Japan has brought. And uh, as a long-standing partner of Japan, as a long-standing friend of Japan, right from our inception in 1971, uh, we look forward to working with Japan as you further this strategy internationally. Thank you. Shavkat, thank you for your very valuable comments. Uh, let me also talk a little bit about what FYP actually means to individuals. Because FYP is not a very hypothetical concept. It must mean something to each country, to each community, to each individual. Only then it becomes a meaningful concept. So when you talk about that, what it actually means is that freedom is about ability to write your own future and have a say in what happens to your community, to your country, no matter where you belong or who you know. And openness naturally flows from freedom. Free places are often places where new information and points of view flow. When we say what we want to mean by free and open in the Pacific, what I mean is that it is an indiv at individual level that people will be free in their daily lives, live in open societies and in countries with freedom. We mean that on a state level that individual countries will be able to choose their own pathways their own partners, depending on their national interests. So as the professor explained to us, it is an open strategy. Countries can choose the way they can choose. And when we seek cooperation with Japan, the very term that we heard from the professor, it is bazaar diplomacy. So you pick and choose. Make your own shopping list and choose what you want. So those are the ways to go about when we explain and understand 
the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, we now come to a more interesting part of the session, which is an open forum for you to ask questions, make comments, give your observations. But before I do that, let me give you the house rules. Please indicate by raising your hand if you ask, want to get the floor. You can ask the question to our speaker, but I will also welcome remarks from our panelists. So, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is now open. Please raise your hand if you want to ask the question. All right, the first question on a gender preference goes to Aisha Kabir. Thank you. So my question, I'll be quick, is um, you mentioned in your speech about uh, a white elephant. You mentioned China. So I think there's another white elephant in the room, Actually, if you too. you introduce yourself. Oh, oh, sorry. My name is Aisha Kabir. I'm a journalist. I'm with a national newspaper called Prothamalo. So you mentioned China, and I feel there's another white elephant in the room which we haven't mentioned, and that is the Chinese BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. Because initially, like, you've given so much details here about the Indo-Pacific strategy, and it was really interesting. But initially, for a lay person, or in general, <coughs> when the Indo-Pacific strategy was first mentioned, first came out, and you know everyone was talking about it, it was seen, generally speaking, as a sort of counter to Chinese B, uh, BRI, to Chinese growing presence in the region. So could I have your comments on that, please? Thank you. Ambassador Shamim. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and let me begin by thanking uh, Professor Jimbo Kim for his excellent presentation. Very said, and lots of thanks to the other panelists for their presentation. Uh, my name is Shamir Ahmed. I'm a former ambassador of Bangladesh, and in this connection, I very uh, fully recall my diplomatic service in Tokyo back in 81 to 84, which is Hachiju, Echata Hachiju Yon. And I was living in the neighborhood of the Kade, I think, you see. I was in Metamachame. Uh, well, I mean, getting back to your excellent presentation, I mean, you have spoken in general terms, but let me bring you to the subject of Bangladesh and the concept of uh, Indo Pacific strategy or outlook or approach, whatever it is. How do you say Bangladesh in the context of Indo Pacific? Uh, uh, or strategy or outlook because uh, here, I mean, there was an, uh, a lot of talks about a lot of expedient interpretation about Bangladesh being a very important country in the context of Indo Pacific. And we hear more about this because we are soon entering into the election season, and there is definitely some focus from some prominent countries in Bangladesh. How do you see, I mean, how do you, is it? Bangladesh particularly important in the context of other literal states in the vicinity, like I would set aside India as a big country, but countries like Myanmar, Vietnam, Thailand. Thank you. Thank you. Air Vice Marshal. Microphone here, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me the floor. I'm Air Vice Marshal retired, Mahmoud Hussain. I teach at a university now. Now my question is related to something military. Because when you talk about Indo-Pacific strategy, strategy in, variably invokes an idea which is related to your strategic issues. Quite often we forget there are two important points, in fact locations in Indo-Pacific, which will shape the future of Indo-Pacific strategies, particularly of the Western countries. One is Australia. Look at Australia. Australia bestraddles with both the oceans, Indian oceans and your Pacific Ocean. Now, our Australian military is expanding, now, expanding tremendously. If you look at the eastern edge of Australia, if you draw an arc, then you find that if you draw a line along to the Indian Ocean, then if it has aircraft carriers in collaboration with the United States of America, it will command the little states of Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. Now, that question is very specific. Now, given the fact that Myanmar has shown Cox's Bazar into its territory, or say for example, San Man, some of the areas. 
Do you feel that there is a necessity for Bangladesh to have a very strong army in order to deter any kind of attack on its maritime territory? When we talk about blue economy, blue economy is not possible without having a blue navy. In that context, we will be having another report. Uh, do you feel that uh, Japan can also take into account the military aspect of this strategy instead of only looking at its non-traditional spheres? Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor, did you want to ask a question? There? No, okay. You have the floor, okay. Microphone here. Yeah. I am Tanvi Mohammad Dipu. I am a small business leader of Bangladesh, FBCCI. My assumption is same Air Vice Marshal because I talked several high officials of Chinese. They think uh, in future the third world war will be happen, may be happen, China and USA. The assumption, they think. So, they calculate, you know, the Pacific strategy means the attack of China, to protect China. I, uh, so, this region, China is very powerful, and Myanmar is also China, same to China. So, Bangladesh, is it possible to join the Indo-Pacific strategy? Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Ken Jimbo. Thank, Thank you. you. Next question, you. Uh, Ex Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Jimbo, for that very interesting talk. Uh, my, I'm Sheila from the Singapore Consulate in Dhaka. My question is uh, regarding ASEAN centrality and its role in this whole evolving regional architecture. Um, as you would know, ASEAN centrality is the underlying principle for promoting cooperation within the Indo-Pacific, where ASEAN's own uh, outlook on the Indo-Pacific is concerned. And ASEAN sees uh, um, ASEAN leads mechanisms and platforms for promoting cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. But at the same time, I think you mentioned also the uh, how this geopolitical contestation has given agents a new voice to emerging powers. We see that I think emerging powers now have agency and there's a this whole new redistribution of uh, power dynamics. So with all these new regional organizations outside uh, of ASEAN, new configurations, you see a lot of centrifugal forces evolving. Has this undermined ASEAN centrality? Is there still a role for ASEAN in this region? Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Speak it on up here. Uh, thank you, Professor. <clears throat> My name is uh, Shahid Khan. I'm a retired soldier. Uh, having added my word of thanks, uh, let me thank you also for several comes. One for admitting very openly the prime cause for uh, the formulation or for uh, the, the emphasis that the West and some of the uh, East Asian countries have led on the Indo-Pacific and the, and the traction that the Indo-Pacific has received uh, at least in the last five years, that China is the main concern. Uh, I've attended umpteen uh, seminars, uh, roundtables, uh, uh, and, and talks on the Indo-Pacific, and none of the participants uh, from the Western countries, uh, least of all the states, have admitted that uh, China is the main concern. In fact, they have gone overboard uh, to assuage that China has nothing to do with, 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 with the, the, the stress on in the Pacific. Uh, it's a very holy, it's a very rhapsodic concept, uh, the free and open in the Pacific. Uh, on, the, on the FOIP, uh, I was wondering, uh, actually the, the substance 
of this formulation, free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, the chairman has added his own sort of idea, but I think it goes on more to suggest something substantive physically as having the ability to you know, sort of maneuver in the space that is offered by the Indo-Pacific. I was wondering, uh, you know, of the five or six uh, major ocean trade routes, only one lie in, in the Pacific. I was wondering, one or two, but I, I'm thinking of ocean, ocean trade routes in the, in the world. So how many in other trade routes uh, and, 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 and trade uh, uh, in oceans have, uh, have uh, uh, this FYP concept been, 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 been applied and where it has been propagated that we want free and open in the Pacific. Why so much stress on this particular area? <coughs> Coming on to the, to the, the question of uh, the, the, the international world order. I mean, what sort of world order are we talking about? Uh, is it the world order that was trampled to the ground when it, Iraq was attacked or Afghanistan? I say, you see, the, the world order has been, has been repeatedly defined by the big powers and the coalition of powers. So who is going to ensure that the world order, who defines what the world order is? Who qualifies what the world order is? Who will ensure the world order is, 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 is preserved, integrated the world order? Because this concept has been defined again. But my, my, my last question is, and which I would like you to perhaps emphasize, is the fact I, I'm worried about the, 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 the state of, or the, or, or the situation that the small states would find themselves in. Because in the Pacific is going to be the, the arena for the big game. It is going to be the region which, will, which houses, who, or which houses the three uh, leading future powers of the world, the China, India and, of course, Japan is that was not going to settle for the fact that China is going to be the leading power in their terms. Uh, China has already taken, overtaken U.S. in dollar term, in, 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 the PP, in the PPP ratio, the GDP, is already since 2014. So when is, going, when, when is the West going to accept that China is there? It's China's time has come, uh, and, and not to live in a conflictive, animus atmosphere, but in a cooperative. You said that you have, your strategy is more competitive, but you're not overlooking the fact that there has to be a cooperative element. But your competitive uh, uh, aspect is more manifest in AUKUS, in the other uh, sort of smaller groupings. But I'm not so sure about the, the, the cooperative strategy in particular. But coming to the small states, I feel that, you know, the, the, the 2,500 years old million dialogue is going to be enacted once again in, 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 this, in this region. If you recall, uh, Professor, the, 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 the <coughs> option given to, to Milos, are they with us or not, or, not, or, or are you, you go down under? And this is what happened to them. Countries like Bangladesh who want to exist uh, without joining the bandwagon, having uh, uh, the ability to man uh, space for diplomatic maneuver, yet under great pressure to join either of the camps, how can they, how can they sort of remain uh, equidistant without feeding their, 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 their essential national interest uh, and, 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 the nation, and, and national and the power, uh, elements of national power? And when it comes to that, what is going to be the role of Japan who in mitigating or in, in sort of attenuating the, the pressures that will be, that be imposed on smaller countries like Bangladesh? Thank you, I've taken Thank longer you. than Thank I should you. have. But, Thank you. Uh, uh, we'll first go to Admiral. I'm Admiral Raval, associated with a maritime think tank. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, first, on comment on the Indo-Pacific strategy. Yes, Japan doesn't have an Indo-Pacific strategy, but uh, my understanding is uh, free and open Indo-Pacific is a strategy for Japan. Japan considers it a strategy. And other countries, 
particularly the Quad ASEAN. For them, it is a normative uh, framing. Is it? Uh, is my understanding uh, right? The, in the, uh, the FOIP is a strategy for Japan. It's not for others. Uh, for others, it is a, uh, a normative framing. Uh, you can answer later. Now, my question uh, is on the, you know, in such deliberation, what happens for a uh, country like Bangladesh? It's become uh, very difficult to identify ourselves uh, with the proceedings. But uh, as you uh, uh, mentioned, it is a bizarre diplomacy, rightly so, because Bangladesh is rightly identified by uh, His Excellency Prime Minister Kishida during his speech in India. In his four pillars, the third pillar, the multi-pillar, a multi-layer connectivity, where Bangladesh has been mentioned is one of the vital, uh, you know, fulcrum uh, country, uh, where uh, the, you know, Bay of Bengal and Northeast India industrial growth uh, corridor, uh, with the help of Bangladesh, Matarbari being the, uh, you know, central uh, focus. Uh, I would like to know what is your assessment on that. And that's very important for us, because it also goes with the uh, connectivity half that we want to become uh, with uh, the regional uh, other uh, things. And another thing, you are a big player in the, uh, in the Pacific. Can you make a provision so that the big initiative that you have taken with Bangladesh, with the uh, uh, Big B and this BOB uh, Northeast India, so that we can become a regional hub, and it's good for the entire region, the geopolitics doesn't come and spoil this. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Jishi Muddin from North South University. So thank you very much, Professor, for your enlightening speech. Um, <clears throat> my pleasure to be here. I studied at Osaka University a long time back. And uh, my question to you, um, because you are an expert on uh, geopolitics, security, um, so do you think that uh, is Bangladesh uh, a crucial player in Japanese security and strategic calculation? Or uh, is it in, in, can Bangladesh be an indispensable partner for Japan for implementing the idea or concept or strategy of FOIP? And my second query is very quick. Uh, can we you have know, just one query, please? Okay, Let thank you very much. Please. Thank you very thank much. You. Oh. We are about to finish, but we have our friends and students from the universities here. So the last two questions will be for our young friends. Yes, sir, you have the floor. The first person to raise the hand. Thank you, sir, for giving me the floor. Uh, myself, Mohammed Raihan. I am a student of uh, International Relations Department. I'm studying South Asian Studies. So my question is uh, to the professor. Uh, recently, the national uh, security strategy of Japan mentioned that China's uh, military activities are serious concern for Japan and mentioned, I am quoting, greatest strategist, uh, strategic challenge for the Japan. So here in the island, the island strategy, chain of island strategy from Okinawa to Yonagani, where there is an installation of high defense technology which can cover China's area. So my question is that, so China's policies of Taiwan in 2049, where China want to annex Taiwan, what would be the Japan policies regarding the annexation of Taiwan? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll give you one more. Thank you for giving me the floor. My name is Ryan Hussain, and I am a lecturer at the Global Studies and Governance Department at the Independent University of Bangladesh. I'm currently on my study leave for acquiring my PhD. So, uh, Professor, you have mentioned that uh, recently that Japan is busy in its own region. So, how do you think this Indo-Pacific helps to hear the voice from developing world like Bangladesh while Japan is busy in its own region and other strategic partners of Bangladesh, like U.S. and China, is tapping on Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for giving me the floor and a very good afternoon to everyone. My name is Shorov Roy. I am a student of the Department of International Relations, University of Dhaka. Currently, I am pursuing my master's degree in Global and Government Studies. Sir, uh, 
as we have uh, discussed about today, the free and open in the Pacific. Sir, in my opinion, what really stands between a free and open in the Pacific is an important issue. The contestations of the islands, as we know, uh, islands like uh, Abu Musa or Shenkaku or or like uh, Kuril. So I, I think uh, uh, these these areas should be uh, solved. So my question uh, to you, sir, that. Uh, what should be the approach to, uh, to, to solve this contestation regarding islands? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, really fascinated uh, by those uh, quite uh, enthusiastic engagement uh, to this discussion, which uh, really appreciate. And I also appreciate uh, to discussions, and I think uh, very well articulated, uh, and also translating this uh, logic uh, into South Asia, Bangladesh perspective, which I learned a tremendous amount from your perspective. I received the um, 11 different sets of the <laughs> question, uh, which I did not think that I can cover all of them in the full uh, spectrum, but I try my best uh, to deal with it. Um, the first question on the uh, BRI and uh, whether the emergence of the FOIP uh, concept uh, is to try to counter uh, this. I think to some perspective this yes uh, to your answer. Um, remember that 2016 was the time that uh, uh, the BRI concept has become very vibrant, launching of the uh, Built and Road Summit and how they can create uh, the infrastructure finance mechanism through the AIIB. And that really triggered uh, the Japanese government. I think I should change. Uh, yes, it seems to be <laughs> better. OK, so the, the time that uh, Japan uh, definitely needs to have uh, alternative viewpoints that uh, should be based upon uh, protecting uh, the uh, free and rule-based uh, international order, not to be dominated by, by one concept. But whether that uh, the FOIP is only try to counter those, uh, you know, proposal based upon the BRI is something quite different, which has been the generation uh, of the concept based upon the reality of what's been happening. Uh, you know, the first version of the MOFA. Uh, you know, PowerPoint slide is the collection of the existing projects, which is very hard to, you know, follow. But uh, uh, that, that really reflects the reality of the Indo-Pacific is already there. The what is lacking is the conceptualization of what's been happening. And so this is the first understanding of the FOIP. But the second understanding is that the follow-up Japanese diplomacy has tried to attempt to connect the FOIP and the BRI. Uh, I think the best example you can trace back is the Prime Minister Abe's visit to China in October 2018. That was the time that the United States have released the new national security strategy and called China as a strategic competitor. They are the revisionists, so we have to have a great power competition, strategic competition uh, with China. Exactly on the same time, Prime Minister Abe visited chi uh, China and then called China as a you know, country to cooperate rather than compete. This is a stark difference of the Washington Japanese you know, try to engage on China. Although we share a lot in common, but in individual engagement on China, especially when that uh, economic interests are uh, heavily you know, granted as a way to promote the so-called win-win cooperation, uh, together with uh, both countries, we have identified so-called third-party market corporations um, that, uh, you know, there are lots in common when we look at the future potential um, investment opportunity in the growing markets where BRIs and FOIP are looking at a uh, lot of, you know, basic uh, uh, um, interfaces. AIIB also become much more multinationalized than probably China originally designed, and then try to have a very modest uh, types of the co-financing behavior together with the ADB and the, all, all, all the others. And those are, the, I think, a common interface that the BRI and FOIP try to pursue uh, in the period 2018 and 2020. Unfortunately, that the many of the projects we jointly identified in the 2018 summit have not been successful. 
and because of the, uh, I think the COVID, uh, you know, uh, has happened. And secondly, what I found was that there are very different standards of uh, financing in terms of the, the train projects, infrastructure projects that they have identified. They have a lots of like a discrepancy in promoting the joint project uh, altogether. But at least we have tried and tried to find those kind of uh, commonality. And I think that uh, in the resuming process of the Japan-China relationship, this still the, remains to be, uh, I think, an important concept to try to find a commonality because we are looking at the sustainable development for the future of the Indo-Pacific. If that such kind of concept could converge together, there's a lots of rooms that the Japan and China can collaborate. And once that we start to collaborate, that will become, you know, creates the comfort to the non-Japan-China players uh, in the field because they don't have to choose between Japan and China uh, on this field. But th these are the conceptual way to understand uh, how we can really co coordinate uh, between FOIP and uh, BRI. Um, the second question uh, concerning about, um, you know, uh, what is the particular, uh, I think, uh, aspects of the Bangladesh uh, to be associated into this uh, concept. I think uh, several, I think, follow-up speakers has already uh, men also mentioned about uh, this. And I, I think um, in my, I'm, I'm a very novice, uh, you know, learner about uh, Bangladesh national strategy and uh, your regional international relationship. But uh, forgive me uh, if I'm looking, uh, you know, uh, quite a wrong perspective. But uh, in, in my understanding, uh, there are enormous interests uh, that uh, Japan has been uh, now, uh, you know, addressing uh, towards the future uh, course of uh, Bangladesh. First of all, as you know, Dr. Lightful Yasmin has mentioned, that there is an emerging potential of the Bangladesh economic growth uh, in, in, in for, the, for the future. And, and that uh, is, uh, you know, together with other SARC uh, country, South Asia uh, is the epicenter of the economic growth next to Chinese growth. And these are, I think, at, uh, you, know, uh, you know, attracting the attention, not in the region, but also, you know, everybody uh, in the world. They rush to come to India, they rush to come to Bangladesh, and that they rush to come to other uh, you know, regional player in South uh, Asia, and we uh, we all need to capitalize it. And this is the first, uh, I think, at the practical importance uh, to identify. And the second, um, I think you carefully observed the outcome of the India's position uh, in the recent, uh, you know, international affairs, and how India tried to readjust its diplomatic stance together with the United States, uh, with the Prime Minister Modi's visit to Washington, uh, D.C. Um, early 2000, Clinton administration, uh, uh, and, and, you know, there was a secretly Clinton, sorry, in the Obama administration, has called India uh, as an emerging democracy that has a huge potential to collaborate uh, with it. But I think, uh, you know, um, India is, uh, you know, huge um, uh, democracy, uh, but it has a lots of, uh, you know, uh, internal problems uh, associated uh, with it. And but the, with the, all the economic growth, those problems uh, should be uh, mitigated because everybody looking at the potential of India and also uh, towards other regions. But whenever that India try to claim to achieve the strategic autonomy, those autonomies are not only generated by its own strength but the balance of the dynamics of the equivalent types of the balance that you have uh, with, uh, you know, remaining partners of India. And I, when I, you know, I visited India three times this year, uh, and I also engaged in the discussion with uh, government officials and uh, intellectuals, and I think that whenever India calls about the autonomy, uh, you were still constrained by your own legacy relationship with Russia and other regions. So the autonomy can only be achieved when you try to have a more balanced relationship with uh, major uh, powers. And I think this is the exact reason of the Prime Minister Modi's uh, visit uh, to the United States. So th these are, I think, a balancing act. It is you know, some, some reporters mentioned about, the, you know, India is trying to lean towards the United States and probably put more efforts on the Quad. My interpretation is different. I think that the United States is a tool 
to achieve the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, strategic autonomy for uh, India. And uh, so in, in that context, um, the Bangladesh position is quite important in a way how to convince the outside world about the status of the governance democracy um, in South Asia. Because India-Pakistan has its own legacy of the relationship. You cannot really get away uh, with it. India-Chinese border issue uh, also constitute issue. And then they have a legacy uh, relation with uh, Russia. And uh, you know, it's, it's a very important how you strategically realign uh, with India on the, on the subject because the uh, world is so much divided. Where world India takes the stance uh, in the world really defines uh, when, when it comes back to the world order issue. India is particularly important uh, in this. But how you can really convince that uh, what kind of values that uh, South Asia is now addressing uh, to the world. And then I think if Bangladesh become the, like a kind of the entry point of the addressing, this is what uh, you know future of the South Asia might look like. It is open, it is democratic, it is uh, you know respect of the governance and then respect of the older people and also the mutual uh, you know uh, relationship in the regional uh, players and Bangladesh is leading SARC agenda and Bangladesh is the major uh, exporters of the international peace missions uh, with the concept that, that those kind of uh, peace reconstruction effort is very much in need Bangladesh is not you know I said I, I mean, we are very busy with uh, you know uh, the problems, but the Bangladesh still offers the values of the government. You know the good governance is important uh, in the world. So these are, I think, uh, one of the showcasing of the wor what the uh, world should recognize the future of Southeast Asia through Bangladesh. And this is, I think, the way I think that is a quite. Um, important to identify, uh, which I, you know, believe that this is a potential way to uh, characterize it. And if the additional kind of things is, if Bangladesh could be instrumental in, I think, uh, um, resolving the issue of Myanmar, uh, that that is also the case. Which, uh, you know, ASEAN is trying with the five-point resolutions and engagement of the chair, uh, you know, the ASEAN chair. But it hasn't really come up with a uh, you know tangible result, uh, and I think if the Bangladesh uh, plays uh, the huge role uh, in you know mitigating the tension and let them to be bring back to the you know the the, the politics of the democratic democratic processes, and that will really create uh, the, the the visions that the Bangladesh become the pivotal player uh, in the you know the regional uh, you know peace uh, and the prosperity, and, and these are. You know my expectation, which I may be wrong, but uh, you know, and, and those are something that I uh, I would like to um, highlight. Um, on, on the maritime, um, you know, non-traditional security issue has been mentioned, and I, I think you know that Malabar has been expanding into the quite an important uh, international collaboration to secure uh, the maritime interests. Um, that's the Indian uh, kind of led proposal together with the United States, but now. Australia has become uh, the major player, and Japan has become the, uh, you know, uh, also the formal, uh, you know, uh, player in, in the, those. And I, something that that is important is to create those kind of military exercise as a regional platform uh, to for the, everybody can, uh, you know, play uh, in this region. That is also true for the Cobra Gold in Thailand. Tandem thrust uh, in in uh, you know uh, in in many other uh, players that is starting from the bilateral, but it's been expanded to the multilateral exercise. We can even invite you know like a China and other players uh, to become observers and to let them know our practices or, or our intention how to secure uh, the sea lanes uh, of communication. And that is not only our benefit, but that is for everybody's uh, benefit. Sometimes that could be contestation if that the standards of the safeties and standards of how you can really mitigate the tension of the escalation will be different. That, that is based on the confrontational model. But I think that the baseline of the security cooperation is create the benefits for everyone. And, and that is, I think, an important way uh, to look at the non-traditional perspective of the security uh, cooperation. You mentioned about the ASEAN centrality. I think uh, it's a great question. Um, 
You know, we recently had a Camp David summit together with uh, uh, United States and, and Korean counterparts. It's, uh, it's a great to see those uh, you know, developments. And we also had AUKUS, we also had uh, uh, Quad. Every joint statement mentioned about the importance of the ASEAN centrality. And uh, some of the ASEAN uh, you know, strategic thinker think that, uh, well, this is only a slogan, that we don't really think that the ASEAN uh, is a central player in, in this field. Uh, but I think that um, ASEAN still plays an irreplaceable role in the uh, institutional building, rule building uh, in the wider region. Nobody but ASEAN can play uh, the chair's role in the uh, multilateral crisis, which I described in the region. Uh, it's not China, it's not Korea, it's not Japan can actually replace uh, the role of the multilateral setting. And so this uh, remains to be a very important perspective of the ASEAN uh, centrality. And secondly, ASEAN also uh, it remains to be the epicenter. Once again, I mentioned about the epicenter where economic growth is in China and, and becoming South Asia, but the ASEAN is the center of the connectivity concept. Whenever you look at the, all the connectivity of the Indo-Pacific, that has to be going through ASEAN regions, and then thus, if the ASEAN is the, the, the uh, you know, the maintain the sound base of the governance of the economic growth, and that will contribute to the whole Indo-Pacific. And this is why we, co we, we think that the ASEAN is a central to this concept. This is not like, uh, you know, diplomatic uh, kind of uh, way of uh, uh, embracing, but I think it's a practically ASEAN uh, is a very important. In that sense that the strong ASEAN, ASEAN Democratic ASEAN um, and uh, reliable ASEAN is everybody's asset. And uh, I hope that the uh, ASEAN remains to be vibrant uh, in the collective strengths to be uh, exposed in international relations. ASEAN takes the critical steps to mitigate the tension in Myanmar is especially uh, very important. Um, and the uh, new addition of the Timor-Leste uh, to ASEAN also adds to the, uh, I think, a legitimacy uh, of the Southeast Asian uh, I think collective strength uh, in the international uh, community. Um, for, and I think it's a couple of uh, questions that regards about uh, you know the world order uh, perspective and what what really represents uh, for today. And I think it's very hard to define because uh, uh, in my perspective, world order is in flux. I mean. You know, Japan has long been the beneficiaries of the U.S.-led or G7-led international uh, system. And I think China is also, all the authoritarian systems are all beneficial from the United States who provided the global commons and the public goods. Uh, everybody can plug and play to the U.S. dollar system, exchange rules, and free trade. Um, you know, th those are benefits uh, for everybody. But now it has been contested by the, the newly emerging systems like uh, authoritarian rules, state on capitalism, sovereign wealth fund, backed kind of, a, uh, you know, the uh, investment uh, behavior. And those creates uh, the notion of what is called the multipolar uh, international system uh, that could potentially attract so many. Uh, you know, with a different reason. Some people are not really particular in, in, in favor of the United States, um, you know, engagement in the region. Some people are trying to utilize those uh, multipolar uh, structure as to promote the uh, strategic uh, autonomy uh, of those uh, region. But at the same time, important things to uh, remind ourselves is what is the penetrating uh, kind of uh, backgrounds uh, and also the interface that really connects the different uh, you know, direction of what the world order uh, should be. And I think that FOIP, Indo-Pacific, remains to be very important. Whatever you think about the world order, we have to live in Indo-Pacific. And, and, and once we wish to promote the concept in Indo-Pacific, there should be the common rules, norms, and understanding to be shared. It is not about you know, how you regard the United States or China or Russia. Uh, in this field, we need to have a more practical rules that will ensure peace and prosperity and rule-based order and the respect of, respect of the all the participating members. And, and those are the something, uh, I think, at, uh, you know, more like a micro level of uh, 
building block processes that should be representing eventually to create what the world order should be. Um, uh, I think that the remaining question from the students uh, that involves uh, the national security strategy, um, uh, what would be uh, Chinese uh, challenges, and uh, what could be the role of Japan. Um, well, thank you for that question. Uh, I think Japan has adopted the new strategy uh, which alters the traditional premises that the Japan is a low-key player uh, on the defense. I mean that the Japan is engaging in the you know uh, in the in the peace mission uh, for long years. It's been declined, but but we also the major player of the United States, the increasing level of the military to military cooperation with the United States, responding to the various scenarios. But now we are defining ourselves that to increase a level of the defense to be adopted by our own defense. Uh, capabilities, including that adoption of the new equipments like a long-range strike capability, really rep represents uh, its importance, how much we are committed uh, to our defense. Because it, um, we are not trying to materially catch up the level of China, because uh, it's a China is uh, far ahead uh, of us, but we are going to obtain the capability which is enough to deny the Chinese prospect of the operational success. So this is a quite a complicated comp uh, issue, is it? Whenever China starts to uh, do the campaign in the whatever that they want to do, we are going to obtain the capability to deny the success of such campaign through those technologies. So you don't have to have a match up one by one, five to five. It can be five to one, 10 to one, but enough to create the concept that is imposing the huge cost of the Chinese operation uh, to be uh, uh, to be happening. So I do not believe that the 2035 or 2049 that the China can successfully, uh, you know, uh, like uh, uh, have a full occupation of the Taiwan uh, through force because we are also trying to adapt ourselves in responding to those uh, crises through, uh, you know, uh, uh, accumulating those, uh, you know, capabilities for the denial, okay? So these are something that I wish to uh, focus. Um, one or two remaining questions and I, I'll stop. Um, w I mentioned about the busy, uh, you know, we are so busy with our own problems, so we have, uh, have retracted our global engagement in, in some aspects. But I, again, that, uh, you know, if I reiterate it once again, the issue of the business is because, you know, the China, North Korea, Russia is uh, challenging us, uh, you know, in the everyday uh, basis, both on the military and, and, and also in the economy. But in order to deal with these challenges, we definitely need the international cooperation, uh, you know, beyond the U.S.-Japan uh, alliance. So our business busyness is really promoting the collaboration rather than, uh, you know, we are confined ourselves uh, sticking to those uh, problems. For example, we definitely want Bangladesh awareness and also engagement in the East Asia because if Bangladesh, South Asian friends will come to our region and the expressing their demonstrating its role will internationalize the problem. China thinks that the only issues are domestic, South China Sea domestic, Taiwan domestic, Senkaku domestic, and nothing else. I mean, third party should not be involved in. And the uh, European states and South Asian states come and say, no, no, no. This is the international issues as everybody is concerned. This really creates the force multiplier for the Japanese defense. And I think vice versa for the Bangladesh security interests. If Japan comes to have a more interaction with Bangladesh, Bay of Bengal, how to deal with the you know Andaman Seas and, and, and those will be, I think, that, uh, I hope that that could be the false multiplier for the future uh, Bangladesh strategy. So something that we wish to, uh, I think, cultivate is the mutual interactions to create the better security environment uh, for uh, all of us. Islands are quite important. I, I eventually come to the end. Um, I think that the, the island defense uh, is particular interest of the FOIP, definitely, because uh, it's a very vulnerable, for, first of all. Uh, and secondly, it also needs to have the very symbolical, uh, I think, effect on how to secure the rule-based 
international order. Uh, UNCLOS, EZ, sovereignty, as uh, are all involved. So if you look at the South Pacific, uh, for example, Fiji, um, Solomon, Vanuatu, where Chinese kind of economic outreaches are enormous. Uh, and I think it, is, uh, it gives the benefits uh, economically, but also it gives a way for China to penetrate strategically to create the kind of commercial satellites, you know, the, the space uh, situation awareness basis, probably in order to counter the, the, you know, Australian global roles or the United States coming into those areas. So those are all associated with how we can really deal with the island's uh, perspective. So I think it is very important to pay real attention uh, to those uh, remote islands uh, perspective. They are the important pivotal players in the connectivity concept. At the same time, they are also very symbolically important to maintain our rule-based uh, international order. I will stop here. Professor, thank you very much for your answers, which further clarifies the issues that were raised. This has been a rich and a fascinating discussion, so I will not attempt to summarize it at all. Only in the conclusion, I would like to say that FYP represents a vision for a region where nations can coexist peacefully, prosper economically, and ensure the security of their interests. As we navigate the complexities of the 21st century geopolitical landscape, it is essential that South Asia actively explores and engages the concept and plays a constructive role in shaping the future of the Indo-Pacific for the benefit of their own citizens. At the end, I would like to thank all of you for being here with us this afternoon and actively participating with your questions and comments. I would like to offer my sincere thanks to the Embassy of Japan for co-hosting this event. And please now join me in thanking our speaker and the panelists for their wonderful contribution. <laughs>